what yeah why do why do you why do you feel that there's always i feel like every time something like this comes out like a combat wheelchair or say um the adventure you wrote for mm-hmm. you know mysteries of candle keep um there's always this bizarre discourse about this why does this keep coming up um and why do you feel it's a vocal minority or or is it just something a minority okay um but i also think (sighs) my heart is racing (laughs) because it's hard to say this stuff um i'm sorry no, it's just, it's scary to say this stuff because people get so angry and have been so cruel. You know, people send death threats over this stuff and it's ridiculous. It's absurd. It is so disproportionate and cruel when, when one in four people will be disabled at some point in their life. Um, I think a lot of it is fear. I think people are afraid of what they are unfamiliar with. And because of the way that we have separated disabled people and hidden them from society and not made them characters in our stories and not shown that disabled people are people, not illnesses or contagious things or scary things. You know, we use wheelchairs in horror movies all the time as a shortcut to say, this is a scary place. What do you think that does when people then see wheelchairs? or asylums, you know, how do you think people that affects people being driven to seek mental health care when everybody goes, oh, you're crazy. And that's been associated for years with this instead of going, oh, you're having some illness, your brain chemistry is off right now. And like, let's, let's treat that the same way we would treat it that if something was wonky in your body, we'd, we'd potentially be able to you know, if you were sick and we could, if you have an infection, we can help that. Um, I think people are afraid of what they don't know. I think people are also afraid because we're the only club that anyone can join at any time, as my friend Christine Bruno likes to say. Um, And I think that's really scary for people. And I think there are people who have decided that any identity that is not what they consider to be the default um, that exists out there is a political statement. Mm. So they think that my existence is a political statement. So the way that they can write themselves into a story, that's fine. But if I write myself into a story, I am making a political statement. And I'm not. I'm just creating a dungeon that I could go to if I wanted to create an idealized magical version of myself. Because my body is my body. And if I wanted to create a character who had a body like mine, D&D, you should be able to do that. Why can't I tell that story? So it's it's tough, you know, like I, I knew that as soon as we talked about the accessibility, there would be blowback. But also I know that if I didn't talk about the accessibility, we'd be having the conversation about the fact that I got to bring back Toshalar. You know, I got to, to bring back a location that's off the Sword Coast and that hasn't been seen in a couple of editions. And people would be really excited about that. These same people who are so upset about this are the people who that, that have been like begging for something that's off the Sword Coast and that's, that's pulling back on, on lore from a different time. And that's what I I did. (laughs) But instead, we're talking about the fact that I have, you know, a way to get from a lower floor to an upper floor that isn't a step. That's not a step sized for one particular type of humanoid. Nobody even knows what's in the dungeon yet. Yeah, like, (laughs) if you have gelatinous cubes in your dungeon, (laughs) how do you think they get around? Yeah. Just it's it's the amount of extra work that marginalized people have to do just to be able to tell a story. The amount of time I lost three days of work because I was dealing with this stuff, like three days that I could be working on other cool stuff because I had to deal with this. And I know that there are a you know, I know Sarah was dealing this because her character went into Idol Champions this week. 
or last week. Um, so she was dealing with it too. Like, this is not what we should be having to talk about with these things, you know? These are important conversations and I want to be having them. Um, but I want to be having them so that we can have a productive discourse, not because we're forced into it, because the existence of people who are different than what has been historically considered the default in stories are being introduced. Right. We have a few more questions. Um, and thank you so much for all of that. Uh, do you have a suggestion for a pregame survey for lines and veils? I am about to run descent into Avernus while a group of ours has never used something like that before. And I think I might need it now. Yeah, lines and veils is exceptionally important in any session zero. And in fact, you should probably not stop having session zero. So <laughs> like you, you should not stop checking in with your players. You'll be surprised what you don't know is going on if you don't check on check in on a regular basis. And I've been guilty of this as much as any person and been surprised that something wasn't working for a player maybe 20 episodes later uh, because I wasn't checking in. But what are your suggestions for session zero? I mean, I think that, that one, one solution that's really good is to have a player survey, especially if you set up something like a Google Doc uh, mm. or a Google survey where you can set it to be anonymous um, because that will allow people to talk about things that they might not otherwise disclose because disclosure is a very personal thing. And with the degree of stigma that exists in the world, um, no one should ever be forced to disclose if they don't want to. So if someone mm. is autistic, say, um, and they don't want to talk about that, they shouldn't be forced to just so that they can have accommodations in game um, if they're not comfortable talking about it. But if they do want to say, hey, I'm an autistic person and not identify themselves, you can create an anonymous survey to allow that. You can also encourage people to talk to you privately or have an open discussion at the table. Um, asking people what their lines and veils are. Um, for me, I do a blanket ban on ableism. It's just not a thing that's at my table unless we're having a very particular discussion about why it needs to be in the world. Because why does it need to be in the world? Why do we have to take our biases from the real world and bring them into a fantasy world? I look at something like Schitt's Creek and you go, huh, they built a world where homophobia wasn't a thing. That's pretty cool. So why... You know, I, I think that having that conversation about what is okay and what's not, and if you want to explore it, that's fine, but have that conversation. Um, and also add a question about accommodations um, to your survey. Ask about, you know, I tend to ask about things like, um, you know, you can use lines and veils for it. You can specifically ask about phobias if you want to. Um, but also, you know, talk about how often you take breaks. Breaks are a big deal. I try and do breaks every hour and a half to two hours. I found that even for my non-disabled players, it makes a huge, huge difference in their attention span um, and their enthusiasm for the game. And obviously my ability to continue running a game with energy and focus. Um, uh, I tend to ask about allergies if you're playing in person. So if someone has uh, an allergy that could be dangerous, like if someone has a nut allergy, you don't want to have people bringing nuts to the game. That's a dangerous, life-threatening situation. So asking about those kinds of things, both for the physical, the real physical and mental health comfort of your players, and also for their characters. As I nearly spill my water. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me look at the uh, next few questions. Uh... I think I have some session zero resources in the accessibility doc too. I'm you do, you positive. absolutely do. Okay, good. Uh, let's see. Yeah, also, uh, this other question isn't really ask them. Uh, like what? If you have clarifying questions, ask. Yeah, there you know? th there is an this question right here is there is an occasional tendency. Well, I wouldn't say it was occasional. Instead of excluding these conditions, exoticizing them and romanticizing them. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any thoughts on how one could become more considerate in that aspect as well? Yeah, that comes up a lot. So I think when you're writing, you could you could have a table. This is a little tricky and you're, you have to put thought into it, but you could have a table um, that when you're describing physical attributes, some of them include physical disabilities. 
Um, but you also don't want that to be the exclusive attribute. So I would say if you do like a two column, if you have, if you, I, people roll up characters different ways and NPCs different ways. So if you would do, have like a two column system where you have um, one or two different physical traits that you're looking at, you could include that. Um, you also could go, I, I want to make sure I'm including, you know, three disabled characters in this town. Um, I have these NPCs, where can I put these characters? Um, you know, there's no reason your blacksmith can't, can't use a wheelchair. There's no reason that um, your, you know, maybe your librarian has a cool modified version of Comprehend Languages and is blind. Right. There's no reason you can't bring that into a game. So, so figure out how you want to apply those traits to characters, I think is one way to go. Um, and just making sure that's included in the mix of the things that make your, your NPCs individuals, but also just ensuring that it's not the only thing there. Um, but yeah, take, take your NPCs and just add that in. Yeah. And, and make that interesting flavor. Like I, I like the idea of a librarian that is reading through their familiar. That, that, that's, that's very engrossing to me. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of imaginative things that can be done that way. You don't necessarily have to see something to understand it. It yeah. can translate into your brain in a different way, or you could have a spell that allows you to convert anything into braille, or you could have um, an ability that al that allows the books the, the words to speak. You know, you put your hand on it and cast the spell, and all of a sudden the book turns into basically an audiobook. You do a magical audiobook, and now you have an auditory version of that. So th there are so many ways to approach it. You know, um, Alindra has spent time with the Ghostwise Halfling with Clan Monkey Mouse. Um, and traditionally, Ghostwise halflings, halflings don't speak. And for me, I went, oh, well, that's because it's a mostly deaf group, like the, the families on Martha's Vineyard. Historically, Martha's Vineyard had a, a very, very high population of deaf, deaf families, um, congenitally deaf families. Um, and so to me, I went, oh, that's, that's kind of an interesting analog. So the Linda spent time there, she'd learn how to sign and she'd learn how to cast spells without speech. Her verbal component could be translated to sign. So, you know, trying to figure out ways to, the way that disabled people move through the world, we adjust, we find solutions. We are incredible problem solvers. I would not be half the producer I am if I wasn't disabled, <laughs> because it forces me to think three steps ahead and plan. I like I know for weeks what my days look like um, because I have to know, because I have to be prepared if I have a bad day or a bad couple of days, how I'm going to adjust. What can I move? What can I reschedule? And what has to get done? Um, and so when I'm producing, if something goes wrong, I have to be ready to go like I, I have in my pocket going, oh, okay, here, here are five alternate solutions we can do. Like, we lost the location. Well, here's, here's all the other places we can go. How did you have this prepared? Well, we had to, you know? So, so thinking about how people might adjust to the situation. There's also like a number of subclasses. You, people could look at, like, look at, when you look at the College of Eloquence, you can fly out, talk to anything. You can communicate to anything. That's it. <laughs> like um the artificer armor like if if you do lose a limb that's replaced by the armor itself and they can never take that armor off of you ever again and i think that's that raises something that i really want to flag which is um don't penalize players for using um accessibility devices yeah so you know i have i have some thoughts about prosthetics costing you an attunement slot um mm. i don't if you if you have characters who are using wheelchairs don't make them cost i mean in the real world they're very very expensive and hard to get but um in in fantasy that's not the case right. uh i don't think it's fair to you know charge a, a chair user a couple hundred gold for something that just allows them to function right um so so you know keep that in mind Though, you know, if you're going to have a magical item that is going to provide bonuses above and beyond getting around in the world and maybe doing a little bit of, of extra goodies, um, depending on what kind of mechanics you're using. Yeah, then, if it's like yeah. an arm that shoots fireballs, 
if you, yeah, if you, if you have an arm that shoots fireballs, that might be a conversation to have about like how yeah. that happened and how you get some some yeah. adjustment. But um, just to get by, I should I'm not, not saying give people free penalty. superpowers, but like you know, when somebody needs a cane, don't don't make it impossible to do. Don't don't disincentivize players from playing these characters because you're making the penalties so steep that there's no feasible way to there's n- there there would be no reason to play it because the penalties would be um crushing well it's it's to your point like why would like give you give the players an option where the this discrim like this discrimination does not exist where this is and is normal and that's yeah. the point and like this, again, this is this is a game you're playing with your friends. <laughs> like this should be an easy conversation to have at the very least. And also, um, you're, we we make our accessibility gear cool. Like we do cool stuff with it. You know, people think of wheelchairs as the push chairs that you see in the hospital. That's not what most of us use. What most of us use are are designed by, you know, people who are working in you know BMX and we're using ultralight materials and titanium. Um, our chairs are self-propelled. Some people have spikes on it because fun fact, never ever touch a wheelchair as used. Never ever touch a disabled person's devices without permission ever, but never touch a person's chair without permission, mm-hmm. um, whether they're in it or not. That is an extension of that person's body and that is not yours for the touching. Um, and I have a permanent injury because people have pushed my chair when I'm in it without my permission. Just trying to trying to help, but right. good intentions, ask, always ask. And people will ask for help when they need it. Mm-hmm. We, we live in these bodies. We, we know how they work and, and what we need. And we've lived in them a lot longer usually than you've known us. So right. we'll, we'll, we'll ask when we need help. Maybe no but, misplaced gallantry. For- <laughs> yeah, but, but, our gear is cool like they do cool stuff we get spinners on wheels like and so when you add magic and like expert blacksmithing in oh my gosh you could do so much neat stuff sword canes yeah yeah (laughs) Um, i just played a i just played a a grandma a punk rock grandma who had a cane and would use that to propel herself around as she would fight like there's so much possibility here so That's yeah, play that fantastic. up. Give your players ways to to kit out their gear. Let's see. We got a couple of other. Qu- How would you do? Well, yeah. There's lots of ways you can do echolocation. Um, mm-hmm. Are are differently abled villains looked upon badly? I um, so don't I'm have just going to pause. With- oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Before we we go there, um, the term "differently abled" is not a a term that is is euphemistic terms like differently abled or special special needs mm-hmm. um those are, are terms we don't use um okay. d- disabled is not a bad word disabled is just like saying tall short you know it, it's part of it's a descriptor um but uh differently abled was a term that non-disabled people tried to use to euphemize our existence um and also to minimize the experience of um ableism that we encounter and systemic uh discrimination that we come up against so um please um use use terms like like disabled um and special needs nobody nothing about our needs is special like we are we're asking for equal access and it's a civil rights thing um so yeah just sorry side no 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 no, absolutely (laughs) i mean like call it out (laughs) And, and that's that is not in any way um this is we're all here to have a conversation about this and learn that's not trying to um, to in, in any way be uh, throw down on anybody. That's that's this is a learning process. But yeah, that's a, yeah. that's a term that. Well, we've got we've got four minutes left. I'd like you to at least have time to plug stuff because you're I know you and you are always up to stuff constantly, okay. not, um, never endingly. So I don't actually know if I can, I don't know what I can plug right well, now. Well, watch out for the NDAs. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So what I can plug is uh, Candlekeep Mysteries is is available for pre order and comes out on March sixteenth. We have uh, Adventures from Level One to Sixteen. It's the newest D and D hardcover. We have a bunch of amazing authors. Said seventeen incredible authors who worked on it. Um, stories that take you to all sorts of spectacular places doing tons and tons of really neat things. Um, 
and we all got to work with Chris Perkins and, and Bill Benham, which was just, you know, there, there's not, this whole thing has been very surreal. It's really weird and amazing to see your name uh, in a book. <laughs> it just, I, 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 that will never get normal <laughs> for me. Um, yeah, I, they showed me art from my, my piece and I cried <laughs> because I'm looking at the art style that I've loved for so long. And then there's these things that came out of my imagination and they're in that style. <laughs> so yeah, Candle Keep Mysteries is March 16th. The alt cover is in your local bookstore. Um, and a bunch of really amazing people worked on it and worked really hard to tell cool new stories. They're all drop-in adventures, one shots. Um, I am the creator of the accessibility and tabletop uh, or the accessibility and gaming resource guide which uh, is linked in the chat. Um, that has links to tons and tons of different places you can learn about disability, um, educate yourself on um, the best ways to make everything from conventions accessible, streaming accessible, you know, tools for captioning, um, resources for getting transcripts made, um, different mechanics that people have created, links to Sarah's combat wheelchair, links to uh, Sleepy Spoonie's stuff, articles about writing and writing disabled characters. Um, it, it's all in there. Uh, what, what am I forgetting? I stream on Twitch as Dreamwisp Jen. Um, I'm on Silver and Steel on Tuesdays. Um, I'm on Twitter as Dreamwisp. <laughs> the pressure is on. <laughs> I know. I'm like, ah. Well, what's funny with you is like, it's always stuff that you can't talk about. Yeah, um, there's there's some stuff <laughs> coming up soon. I just don't know if I have permission to talk about it. So follow follow my Twitter, and I'll announce the things that I can announce when I can announce them. Yeah, uh, the accessibility <laughs> guide is so incredibly thorough. Uh, it is more than just a google doc i mean it is a google doc yeah, but it, wow it was a couple of years in the works um and yeah. it was selfishly kind of my way of of creating something so that i could stop answering a lot of the same questions but also to provide that resource so people could know what the resources are that you know so i could vet the resources and really um give information that i think is quality information to help more inclusivity and representation out there. Um, yeah. Disabled people come in, in from all communities. You know, we're one of the only groups that spans all other groups. So um, everything is a disability rights issue and every other group's issues, you know, matter to us too. So, uh, yeah, take care of each other and put, put expand your worlds. You know, put put people into those worlds so people can see themselves in fantasy because that informs how we behave in our reality. You know, our stories matter. Um, they change the way we, we think about our real world and better, better representation and more inclusivity in our stories means people get treated better in the real world. And that's, that's the power of tabletop. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jen Kretschmer. Thank you for being on the show. You can find all those links Thanks in so chat right now in Twitch. So I, I encourage you to check those out. And you'll see Jen, uh, I believe, later today <laughs> on the same channel uh, playing Alindra in uh, Silver and Steel. Uh, thank you all for watching. Please take care of each other. Please wear a mask. And uh, don't forget to love each other. <laughs>